Hi everyone. I don't have too much time, so pay it. Pay attention! What's wrong with you? Focus! For someone so smart, you can be so stupid. I mean, how could you forget about that? We just talked about it. Cuddy, something wrong with your brain. Do you even think? I do think, actually. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I'm finishing a PhD in experimental cognitive psychology, or literally, the scientific study of thinking. But I have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, predominantly inattentive. I mean, I've spent so much time distracted by extraneous things, you may notice that one of my eyes has almost permanently dedicated itself to my periphery. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, okay. <laughs> As of 2011, the CDC reported that 11% of children ages 4 to 17 had been diagnosed with ADHD. That's 6.4 million kids, three Houstons. And unlike fruity cereal, ADHD is not just for kids, but 4% of adults had been diagnosed, 9.8 million people, New York City plus Philadelphia. One thing I forgot to mention, all of the expressions that I began with have something in common. They've all been said to me by people who have proven time and again their unconditional love, support, and willingness to do anything for me. But in those moments, they were extremely frustrated. So being so common, where does ADHD come from? Long before I knew my cognitive traits were called ADHD, I began studying how natural environments affect attention compared to urban environments. What research consistently shows is that natural environments can restore, even improve, your ability to sustain focus. That's because they attract, uh, or they contain more items that attract what's called involuntary attention. Sudden movement, noise, <laughs> an odd odor, bright colors, anything that breaks the consistency of your environment that you reflexively turn your attention to is engaging involuntary attention. And that's the kind that's cranked up in people like me, so it doesn't take a loud noise or a bright color to distract us, but any noise or any color. Engaging involuntary attention, like natural environments do, gives the other kind of attention, voluntary attention, a break. That's the kind we use to stay focused on long, mundane, but important tasks that make us feel mentally tired because it runs out. It's the kind you pay. It's also the kind that ADHD folks particularly suck at. But it's kind of important not to suck at in modern society. But it's likely that involuntary attention was adaptive during human evolution. The ability to notice slight movement in the brush, the color of ripe fruit behind leaves, detect the faint trickle of water, or catch sight of a distant herd of prey just before they disappear over the horizon, and the impulse to follow them would have contributed to your eating lunch and not becoming it. <clears throat> a few years ago, scientists discovered that men of a certain nomadic group in Kenya who had a genetic variant that's implicated in the restlessness and shifting curiosity of ADHD were better nourished than their counterparts without the variant. But in a group of those same people who split off to live sedentary lives, the men with the variant were undernourished compared to their counterparts. Interesting. This, dis uh, this information has kindled discussion as to whether ADHD should even be pathologized. I mean, if it was adaptive for survival, then it's supposed to be here. And whether you know it or not, humankind, you're grateful for us. So could we at least start going by potential hunting and gathering badasses instead? <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> What good would that do us, right? I mean, the 16.2 million people in America alone with ADHD can all abandon modern life for hunting and gathering. I mean, I'm definitely considering it. <laughs> but <clears throat> it just gets one thinking. Is ADHD inherently dysfunctional, or is it more of a fish-out-of-water condition? 
Imagine traits that were once potent fuel for the fire of nomadic success are now remnants, glowing embers waiting to be stoked, nurtured back to life. What if the stigma of ADHD and its exclusion from mainstream ideas of functionality is a prohibitive drizzle suppressing those embers, though unable to extinguish them? In this firelight, I've noticed from my own experience several benefits of ADHD that are applicable in the modern world. For one, brainstorming. Sure, my mind is rarely quiet, but I'm comfortable in that. The sheer number of thoughts and ideas is astounding. Even if a lot of them are bad or half-baked, they're great jumping off points for deeper thinking. One distraction can lead to an unending train of thought, fueled by intrigue for each next thing. It's like popping popcorn. One kernel goes, and then they all take off. I'm also good at navigating outside my comfort zone. If something's intriguing, I can't not pursue it. So um, my interest often trumps any anxiety from exploring something foreign. I have to know what's over there. That culture, that school of thought, that hobby or lifestyle, or literally beyond the next mountain. So instead of being encamped, I've explored to know what I love and hate about opposing political ideologies or parenting styles or subcultures. And yeah, it's scary to explore, but scarier by far is the thought that I still don't know what I don't know. <laughs> and I'm resilient. I have to be. Parts of having ADHD in this world really, really suck but I quickly get distracted from them. <laughs> Whether it's a conflict with a family member or frustration with my own shortcomings, it's true. Emotionality is higher and self-regulation is more of a challenge, but I find I'm able to move on from negativity pretty quickly by a simple change of setting or activity. Sometimes I even forget I was upset. And I'm adaptive. Within attention, you have to embrace the fact that you will forget, misplace, overlook, put off constantly. So you learn to bounce back from the consequences quickly and creatively. I'm kind of a damage control expert. I often, without ruminating, will jump to, what's salvageable? What about this problem is useful? Even for the few that aren't my fault. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, my passion is authentic. I'm really bad at feigning interest because I can't inhibit my natural intrigue. So if I'm showing interest in a person, activity, or idea, that's real. I don't have to try to pursue my passions. That's all I can pursue. People often don't realize that ADHD includes the capacity to hyperfocus and absorb information like a sponge, just not to choose upon what you're hyperfocused. But it is not laziness, and it's not changing. So again, with all these pluses, is it really a disorder? Well, it does result in significant distress and is characterized by diminished functioning in ordinary life. But where does that distress come from? Not fitting well within the narrowly standardized educational and inst uh, industrial institutions of our society? Well, not without pharmacologically dulling some of my own favorite traits anyway. What if some disorders aren't of individuals, but of whole groups? maybe even whole cultures or societies. I think that as a society, we suffer from what I like to call P-U-D, pro-uniformity disorder, or affectionately, PUD. <laughs> <laughs> Despite my superpowers, a month and a half ago, I was up late standing in my kitchen while my family slept and was in a bad way. I could see my traits affecting my partner, my son. I was not making progress on work long overdue. Trying medication, overdoing it on self-care, taking time to recharge, but still unable to focus. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm supposed to give a TEDx talk in six weeks about why I'm glad I have ADHD. <laughs> but I'm not. Shortly thereafter, a suspiciously timely image came through social media that really impacted me. I'd like you all to just take a moment with me and reflect on it with respect to your own lives.
are you rebelling? Are you helping the people around you win their own rebellions? Are you helping the children around you never have to fight one? The suicide rate is higher in people with ADHD and their families. My clinical colleagues have shared with me that many children they see with ADHD have already begun at young ages to self-loathe, even having thoughts and often actions of self-harm or suicide. The youngest example shared with me was seven years old, daily thoughts of self-harm. The stress of not being able to function in an environment for which you're not adapted while expected to, it's heavy. People often think the comorbidities of ADHD, like self-loathing and depression, are purely inherent to the condition. But I'd argue they're in large part due to how outsiders react to us. So if you're the parent, guardian, teacher, sibling, friend of, or care about a child who is a potential hunting and gathering badass <laughs> or a literally unstoppable brainstormer. Help them win their self-love rebellion. Check your frustration. If uh, instead of punishing their shortcomings, nurture their abilities. If you find they're distracted, ask them, what were you just thinking about? Not because they're in trouble, but because it could be fascinating. And get them outside in nature. It can actually be as good as Ritalin. <laughs> I'm still fighting my rebellion every day. And it's far from one. But it's even further from lost. So I'm going to leave you with a very simple tactic for fighting your own rebellion, whatever your battlefield may be. Since I was a kid, whenever I feel completely misunderstood or unappreciated, alone, because I don't think right. I'll seek out a mirror, look straight in my eye, and reassure myself, not narcissistically or egotistically, but genuinely. I love you, because as long as you do, somebody does. And as long as somebody does, Cuddy, you're going to be all right. Thank you. <laughs>